Hey there, it's Olivia Savannah here from Olivia's Catastrophe and today I'm here to give you my November wrap up. In the month of November I read 13 books and it was generally a very good reading month overall. I'll leave content warnings in the description box down below but without further ado let's get right down to the books. So I am going to be starting with a book that I really really loved and had such a great time with this month and that is Take a Hint, Danny Brown by Talia Hibbert. This is the second book that's loosely connected to Get a Life, Chloe Brown. I loved it, everyone said I would love it and they were completely correct and I gave this book five stars. It's a new favourite. So this is a romance book and we follow Danny Brown who is this black, fat, bisexual woman who's really into studying and her PhD and her research and she loves that so much and then we've also got Safia who is this Muslim guy who works at a school but also his passion lies within mental health and sports and he's got a lot of trauma from something that's happened which has caused a lot of anxiety in his life and he is best friends with Danny when he ends up kind of rescuing her from being trapped in a lift during a drill in a school that they both work and people capture that and think they're in a relationship and it starts giving Zafir a lot of press for his mental health and sports work that he does that he wasn't previously getting so they agree and arrange to fake date so that that press and attention can keep going so that he can grow that business endeavour that he's looking into. It was so, so, so cute. This was just one of those books that will make you happy and you don't need to think too deeply about it. You don't need to read too much into it. You can just enjoy the happy vibes. You can just enjoy how perfect this couple are for each other. And the fake dating situation is handled so well. It feels so realistic and it's woven in quite well. And sometimes it takes a long time for the couple who are fake dating to realize that they actually fancy each other. But I kind of appreciated the pace that this book goes out in terms of their relationships, especially as Danny is someone who is not romantic and is not looking for romance in their life. And then Sophia, who listens to audiobook romances all the time, is clearly very romantic and wanting that happy ending and sparks and fireworks. So they could not be worse paired or paired in a worse way, but they make it work. They kind of work through their relationships, but they also have to work through some of the barriers that they hold against themselves. And it was just so interesting for me to read this book in particular because I very much align with Danny and I definitely am like Danny in many, many ways. And yet I absolutely loved Sophia. I thought he was a brilliant male main character. I love seeing how he was so sporty and so strong and really all of that kind of jock vibe that you get when you look at him but deep down he is or not even that deep even though he's got a grumpy exterior he's very loving he's very caring and he's very protective of those who he cares about but funny at the same time and i just felt like i don't know he's the ideal man he's definitely book boyfriend material for sure. There are steamy scenes in this one and I have to say the steamy scenes in this worked a lot better for me than the ones in Get A Life Chloe Brown. I thought they were off the charts, fire and steamy. There was a particular chapter that I absolutely loved and it just had me smiling so much while I was reading it so it was just overall a very very good reading experience. I will say that the third act breakup in this one isn't entirely necessary. It felt more contrived than it does in other romance books usually I'm quite easy on a third act breakup but in this one I just really didn't see how it fit in. It felt very very forced and just utterly unnecessary but whatever. I don't care. I was having a good time. I was here for the ride. This is definitely one of the best romance books. I've. It's going up there next to my top two favourites. This is now third. So take that as you will. A very, very good book. I can't wait to continue and read the rest of the series. I also want to tell you about another yellow book that I read this month and that is Nick and Charlie by Alice Oseman. This is a novella set in the Nick and Charlie Heartstopper universe. And we're following Nick and Charlie when Nick is about to go to university and it's because Charlie is a year younger than him or two years younger than him, I can't remember. It's about will their relationship be able to survive that transition. We never see the transition actually occur within the novella but it's all the lead up towards it. And this is also written in prose. So this was a jolt to the system in two ways because first of all they're so much more older and more mature and more secure in their relationship than they are in the graphic novels because they are two years older but also it was in prose and I haven't read Heartstopper in prose before so it was just a really big jolt to the system 
them, but it was a good jolt. I read this within a day. It's very quick, it's very easy. It's got some illustrations to it, which is really, really nice. And I do think this is something that a lot of couples go through if they were dating in secondary school for several years and then the university hurdle gets thrown their way. And I've known couples who have survived that hurdle and some who haven't. So it's just interesting to see how this book portrayed it. I do think it got a little bit repetitive there in the middle, which is impressive because it's such a short novella, but I didn't really mind. I had a good time. It was a good read. If you love Heartstopper, this is worth your time. Up next, I'm going to talk to you about The Lost Hero by Rick Roridan. And this is the first book in the Heroes of Olympus series and this is the sequel series that follows after the Percy Jackson and the Olympian series and I have to say I procrastinated reading this for the longest time. When I was younger I thought the Percy Jackson series was brilliant, fantastic, it did not need a sequel series, I don't tend to like sequel series, I just thought no. But after doing my Read It Backwards series for the Percy Jackson ones I thought I should just give at least the first book a shot. So I did, and it's safe to say I loved it. I actually think this is better than the first book in the Percy Jackson series, no lie. It is just such a good continuation, and there are many reasons around this, but in this one, Percy Jackson has gone missing, and then there are some new heroes that arrive who are much older than the age that they're supposed to be when they arrive at Camp Half-Blood, and there's been silence from the Greek gods for a very long time. Nobody knows what is going on, and there is a new quest. I think that's the best way I can summarise it without spoiling too much from the first series, but it was just such a good continuation. I think reading this, you can see how Rick Roridan's writing has improved from the first book and grown. Yes, it's still an adventure. Yes, they still have different obstacles they need to face, but overall it felt a lot less episodic than the first series did. I also think he did a great job with these new characters. He makes them distinct enough and different enough that they're their own personalities, but at the same time, I can see similarities within the group dynamic to the trio that we follow in the Percy Jackson series. But it's different enough that they're their own, and it's different enough that you can fall in love with them. I fell in love with Leo Valdez. He needs protecting at all costs. He's fantastic, he's funny, and he's wonderful. And Leo Valdez is a very good reason to read this series. But also you get cameos from previous characters, and you can tell that the events of the last series are not irrelevant. He's taken the world and, in what I think is a very exciting and clever way, built on it in a way that feels like a natural extension of the series, almost as if Rick Riordan had that planned all along, which I would struggle to believe. But he pulls it off so effortlessly that I was very, very impressed. I just think this was fantastic and I can't wait to continue the series. It's very much one of those books where everything wraps up within the storyline, just as a first book in the series should and yet there is still enough left open for you to continue reading and look forward to the rest of the series. So this was so good. So, so, so good. Yes, finally finished reading Death Note Volume 5, and this is a series that is, you're gonna hear this so much, but this is a series where we follow these characters in Japan, we follow Light, and he discovers a Death Note, which has dropped from the gods from above and these death gods write in the death note who should die and then they die within a certain period of time. But when this notebook falls down to the earth and Light picks it up it means he is granted that control over the notebook and he decides to start killing off people who have committed crimes so that he can make the world a better place. And of course as loads and loads of people start dying across Japan the police are trying to figure out who is doing this, why and try and catch them. So this is the fifth book in the series and I have to say so far it is my least favourite in the series. I think it just went a bit too far. These books have been so good at being very clever and the dynamic between one particular detective who's trying to catch him and him, they're just in this masterful mind game where they're scheming against each other and it's brilliant and it's wonderful to see. But I do think they took this a bit too far in testing people's limits and what they would and wouldn't do and therefore it just became unrealistic and I couldn't suspend my disbelief that much and it was just a bit too over the top for my liking and so while I still think I will continue the series and there are lots of elements of the series that I do still enjoy I just wasn't as captivated by this particular book in the series as I would like. I also feel like some characters did some very out of character things but that's 
that's just the way it goes. The art is still amazing. I still love Elle. I still kind of love Light, even though that's troublesome. And I'm having a very good time with the series overall. This volume just wasn't it. And I'm hoping that in the next volume, things will pick up a bit more. Then also read It's Not About the Burqa, which is edited by Miriam Khan, and this is a collection of essays from Muslim women, and it's just about what their experiences as Muslim women are really about and what being Muslim is really about. So these essays are from a wide range of people and on a wide range of subjects. I really liked the essays that deal with feminism, quite a lot of them do, but also what is actually in the Quran, what is things that they actually practice and believe, but also kind of the diversity within those beliefs and faiths and how one person's faith might look very different in practice to how another person's faith looks like. But also there's lots of speculation and there's lots that goes around in the news about what the rules are of Islam and what is and isn't halal and haram etc etc but it's good to hear about it from people who actually practice and live that life day in and day out it talks about Islamophobia it talks about racism especially because there is a type of culture and race that you picture when someone says Muslim and if someone fits outside of those identities that you're picturing right now and I said that they might experience a feeling of discrimination from not only the community but also those outside of the community and hostility and it unpacks so many different things and I just loved this collection. I really, really felt like I learned a lot from it and it surprised me how feminist the religion really is and I really appreciated getting to see that and getting informed about that but also in just lots of different ways that I wouldn't have considered. I did know the basics, I did know the stuff that most other people know but this just goes into so much more detail. I will say that the first three or two essays weren't my favourite, they didn't captivate me and I was actually thinking I don't know if I'm gonna like this collection but then after I got past those first two or three every single essay was a banger, every single essay had me thinking, every single essay had me learning more and that is exactly what you want from an essay collection so I just soaked these up and I really really recommend it. I read The Midnight Club by Christopher Pike and this is a young adult quite quick and short novel about these children who, well I should really say these teenagers who live at a teenage hospice which means they're all terminally ill and what they do at this hospice is at midnight they have formed a club and they gather and they tell each other scary stories at night and this synopsis makes it sound like it's going to be a horror book but actually I want you to go in not thinking about it as a horror book because while it's got creepy stories in there and elements like that and the TV series as well makes it look very creepy from the trailer it's not actually that scary it's mostly heartbreakingly sad because all of these children are dealing with their terminal illness, trying to face up to the fact that they are going to die and having to prepare themselves for that mentally and you can see how the story reflect how they got their illnesses and the situations that they're in but also what they think things might be like afterwards. And it got a bit cheesy there at the end but I didn't even mind. I was in my feelings, I was emoting and I was just surprised by this book because it was not what I expected but what I got was still very very lovely. It was a good time. I could understand why the character made the decisions that she did. I do wish it was longer. I feel like it could have been longer and I was surprised by how much the storytelling was the key focus and took up more pages than I thought it would have. But I had a good time with it, so I don't really mind. Ooh, and then we have A Tale for the Time Being by Ruth Ezeki. This was something else. So Ruth Ezeki has done it again. I absolutely thought this was a brilliant, brilliant book. And A Tale for the Time Being follows these two women. One of them is a teenage girl who lives in Japan. She grew up in America. She's moved to Japan because her father lost her job. They're kind of broke. Her father is really struggling with his mental health and emotionally and she herself is being bullied at school and is also struggling with her mental health. They're all just really struggling in this family. She's writing this diary and then we go to the other storyline where there's this woman who is called Ruth. She lives in this very small town on a very small island and she gets this diary that has washed up on the shores and she starts reading it and it kind of connects to her life but she also really starts to worry about this teenager who is clearly struggling and is clearly being bullied and she tries to do as much research as possible to see what the outcome of that diary might or might not have been. 
There is a major content warning for this book that I did not expect. This whole story is about that. This whole story is shrouded in it and there's lots of portrayals of it. So that will be the first content warning in the description box below for this book. But I will say this book was really magnificent. It's one of those books that starts very slowly and is very slow paced, but it builds and it builds and it builds. And by the end of it, you are just transformed. And it had me thinking a lot about life, which is a very fast thing to be thinking about. But just like the Book of Form and Emptiness, it really had me examining some of the things that I do, whether I appreciate the present moment enough. Am I too busy planning ahead instead of enjoying and being thankful for the small things in my life? It also, once again, had me examining materialism and objects and what is the important things in life. Do we need all of these items? And Ruth Ezeki always does that with her books. They're focused on the storyline, they're focused on certain characters, and yet she manages to touch on so many themes that when you're trying to summarise the book, you struggle because it will touch each person in different ways and in different aspects of their life. And it's a moving story and it had a very good ending that wrapped everything up nicely and sensitively but also not too perfectly in a way that reflects life very well. She writes beautifully, I took a lot of quotes from this book and also I really like the two different formats and the two different styles to this book. I think they contrasted each other well and if I ever got bored of one because the story does move that slowly she would switch and I'd be in another perspective and refreshed and ready to dive back into the story. I think it captures and examines Japanese culture very well, especially what it's like to be someone who's approaching Japan from the outside, but also it does a very good job of kind of examining some of the pitfalls of Western culture too, while doing so. It was just such a good book, such a good book. I'm still thinking about it to this day, and I think about it regularly, and I try to discuss it with everyone I knew who read it, and I think this is a match made in heaven. Me and Ruth Ezeki are going to go a long way. I've read three of her books this year and this will not be the last. I also read World War Z by Max Brooks. So it's about the zombie apocalypse, about World War Four, World War Three essentially, if it was zombies that attacked the earth. But it's done in a very, very interesting way because it's told almost as if it's non-fiction. It's told as if a journalist is doing interviews and getting stories from people and testimonies about what their experiences were before, during and after the war. And I have to say I was very, very impressed by how inclusive and intersectional and diverse this book is because sometimes when you hear World War, it's really focusing on certain countries. This. No, no, no. This goes to every single country, every single, con well, not every single country, that would be a big book, but it goes to every single continent at least and shows how different countries had different advantages and disadvantages, which meant they dealt with the zombie apocalypse in slightly different ways. And it also talks about so many things. It goes into personal stories of parents and children and how they tried to survive, or people who were equipped for living in these kind of circumstances and those who weren't. It mentions disabled people, it mentions people of colour, it mentions the ways in which all of their lives were transformed in terms of politics, in terms of economics, in terms of culturally, and you can see these different shifts. You get to see it from the beginning, middle and the end and the outcome, so you get to see how the war started and what people did or didn't do, which led to situations that happened during. You get to see what the war was like in the water, on land, in the cities, in the rural spaces. It just, every single aspect you can think of for covering a zombie apocalypse, this book does it. Every single perspective, I'm impressed. I'm impressed that a book could do that and be fiction, but also feel like reading a non-fiction. It was just a perfect mashup of what I love in good creative writing, which is a lot of creativity, but also a lot of thought and structure put into this book. I was thinking about it for days after I finished it, and the more and more I thought about it, the more and more genius I thought this book was, and it won't be the last Max Brooks that I read. It's kind of ironic that this was the oldest, one of the oldest books in my TBR, because it was literally just such a great book. I think I've mentioned a lot that I've been thinking about materialism and consumerism, so it's no surprise that I then read Consumed by Asia Barber, and I actually gave this book five stars. It's a new favourite, and I know that you might not notice this, but non-fiction does not usually get five stars from me on my channel, unless it's a memoir. It's so rare, but this book 
deserves it all. It was a fantastic read. So this is actually all about the need for collective change in terms of fast fashion. So Aja Baba, who works in the fashion industry, is particularly looking at and examining fast fashion culture. She goes into a lot of detail on her own experience as a black woman who breaks into the fashion industry and some of the issues with racism and some of the issues with classism and nepotism but she also really looks into the issues that we have with the fashion chain industry how clothes are made who is making them but also the cycle of donation and how people see that as part of the solution whereas donation is not actually the solution it's still creating a lot of stuff that you might not be holding on to but might be going somewhere else and i can go into a lot about this book. I've been discussing it with whoever will listen to me because I think it's very fascinating and it's also kind of ironic that I was reading this because I hate clothes shopping. I don't really do lots of shopping. I probably buy less than seven items a year. I have a capsule wardrobe and half of it is second hand so I'm really not part of the problem within the fashion industry. But what I especially liked about this book is that while she's talking specifically about the fashion industry and she's done her research and she knows her stuff, so much of it can be applied to consumerism on a larger scale. So I was reading this and I was learning about the fashion industry and those issues but a lot of the things she talks about in terms of shopping habits and the addictive quality and consumerism and what are the solutions to consumerism you can relate it to book buying. And so it had me thinking about my TBR. And I appreciate that because I need to be thinking about my own habits. As well as giving you a lot of research and a lot of how to's, she also then brings into solutions and things you can do, baby steps that you can take to wean yourself off of the addiction of fast fashion and consumerism, but also larger steps that you can take when you are prepared and ready to read it and do them and put them into action. Very, very good, such a brilliant resource. More people need to read this book. Up next, we have Trust by Hernan Diaz, and this one was on the Booker, either shortlist or long list, one of those two, and I finally read it. So Trust is this very interestingly told narrative where we're following this economic finance guy who is really good at what he does, who people believe has a large role to play in bringing about a recession. And it's also about his wife and his wife kind of goes through a slow recluse from society, gradually draws herself away from society and there's rumours of mental health issues and there's lots of rumours about how she died, why she died and who was involved. And so this book first follows a fictional tale of the couple and what happened and then a story from the man himself on what happened and then also a story from someone who knew him about what happened. And so it's the same story kind of told from these different perspectives, but it doesn't feel repetitious because it's not ever exactly the same story told. They all have differing opinions on what's happening. And it's a very interesting look at the way perspective on stories and perspective on people's lives change your opinion of them and what do you think might have happened or not have happened and whether we actually know the truth by the end or not. What I will say is that I thought it was fine. I don't think it was spectacular but I don't think it was particularly bad either. I was mostly feeling okay while reading it. I never got to the point of boredom but I never quite got to the point of enjoyment either. I didn't get close to the characters. They weren't really characters you could draw close to. It just felt like the writing kept me at a bit of a distance from them. And therefore I was never really enraptured about what was the truth to the story. I didn't really care <laughs> whether I got the truth or not. And I kind of guessed what the truth was by the like second retelling of the story. So then when it came around at the end, I was like, ah, it's nice. That's nice. But I didn't feel the shock. It was fine. That's all I really have to say. Decent read. Wouldn't recommend it, wouldn't not recommend it, you know? We have Paula by Isabel Allende and this is her memoir and there's no dust jacket to this because I thought the dust jacket was so ugly so I binned it. So Paula is a memoir that's kind of split into two parts intertwined together so it's about Isabel Allende's daughter Paula who falls into a coma and as her daughter is in a coma she tells her daughter her life story about everything that's happened to her as a mother and 
it kind of switches between her past but also to her looking after her daughter and taking care of her daughter while she's in that coma and how she feels about the whole situation. So of course it's very very emotional in terms of a mother having to care for her daughter even though her daughter's an adult and having to reconcile the fact that maybe her daughter won't wake up and seeing her daughter's husband kind of dealing with the same struggles as well that was emotionally hard hitting but I was also quite intrigued by Isabella Allende's past because there was so much about her that I didn't actually know. While I do know the history of Chile and Pinochet and dictatorship and I knew that she'd lived through the experience I didn't clock that her last name was Allende and that she would be related to Salvador Allende. I just, you know, you know last names that you think are really common so you just don't connect the dots. Yeah, that's how I felt. So reading this, it was kind of mind blowing to me to see this perspective of her and how closely related she is to a lot of the political ongoings at that time. And if you're someone who doesn't know anything about the history in Chile and you don't know anything about Pinochet and the dictatorship, I really recommend this as a very personal and easily accessible way to see that history unfold when you don't want to do research and read a hardcore non-fiction book. This memoir is a good way to kind of learn a bit more about the turmoil that was going on there and some of the knockoff effect it had on lots of people's lives in terms of disappearances but also in terms of murder and political devastation. And so while I knew this history because I did study it in school, it was kind of interesting to me to actually see it from a personal perspective that I'd never seen before. But saying that, it's not all about history, it's also about the mother-daughter relationship, but also Isabel Allende had such a wild life. She has a big family, so she talks about some of the things that her big family has gone through and into some of their stories, but she's just a woman with a lot of strong beliefs and with a lot of feminism within her way of feminism and when feminism was not too popular and she talks about her culture and it was just like reading a family saga book in terms of fiction but also reading a book that's heavily focused on grief that also has a political element and I was just impressed with how she balanced all three of those narratives within this memoir. Again it's another one of those books that's been sat on my shelf for years and I haven't read it and I'm so glad that I did because it was very very good. It has an awful cover but who cares the contents are amazing. <gasps> So I read another non-fiction book that was not a memoir that I loved so much that I gave it five stars and it became a new favourite and that is Stronger by Porna Bell. Now Stronger is what it says on the cover, changing everything I knew about women's strength. And at the beginning of this non-fiction book, Porna talks about how she lost her husband and she tries to bring a mattress upstairs after losing her husband. She's been grieving for a long time, she's been emotionally struggling and she's trying to reconcile and get back on track with life if you possibly can and she's trying to bring a mattress up the stairs and she cannot do it and she realises that all of this relationship that she's had with her husband, he's done all the heavy lifting and she's had enough and she decides she's going to become stronger and so she begins power lifting and that's kind of the basis for how she started to write this book because not only is it about her own powerlifting journey and her own grief and how fitness focused her and honed and helped her get her life back on track, it's also just a, an examination and a research into why women are not more into fitness or are not encouraged into places and spaces where fitness could be accessible to them. And what is wrong with the culture? What is wrong with the culture that's pushing women away from their own fitness journey, from being physically stronger as well as mentally stronger? And it's quite a feminist outlook on it. And I appreciated seeing her talk about her own childhood and her own Indian culture and heritage and how that has influenced her choices. But she's also just so intersectional. You can tell she's done her research and really made this a work that will reach everyone. She talks about what it's like to be going into fitness as someone who is disabled, going into fitness as someone who is a woman, going into fitness as someone who is a person of colour, about gym spaces. It's also including and in talking about fitness on your menstruational cycle, fitness when you're old and elderly and you're going through menopause. And it's all these elements of fitness that I've never heard about before, that I never learned about before. I started reading a book, this book in a vlog and I wasn't really feeling it because there was a lot that I already knew as someone who is 
always practicing fitness and really into it and into the social media culture around fitness as well. So I thought, I know all of this stuff, I know all of this troublesome stuff about fitness and language, but then she got into a lot of stuff that I just did not know and it was enlightening and eye-opening and I just, I appreciated how intersectional she is, but also just how much I learned about something I thought I knew so much about absolutely fascinating so much in this book that we can take on and really put into practice in terms of our language around fitness but also culture around fitness what is harmful what is not what needs to be encouraged she lays it all out here and if you're someone who's slightly into fitness or even slightly into feminism or not into fitness at all even i think this is a good one just to think about why you're not into it and what it could offer you and then last but not least, we're going to be ending on a bit of a downer, but I did read Cameron Battle and The Hidden Kingdoms, and this is a middle grade fantasy book that's an adventure fantasy, and we're following our main character who has this magical book, and if you read from this book, you kind of enter into this new world, and her pet, his parents previously entered into it, and they unfortunately passed away, but it's because the kingdom needed saving and they were trying to save it, but now as the descendant of his parents, up to him to try and save this magical kingdom that he's never been a part of until now. I really struggled with this one and I just didn't like it overall. I just was incredibly bored while I was reading it. I've read quite a lot of middle grade adventure books, surprisingly. Middle grade adventure fantasy tends to be my genre and I just felt like it was like every single other one but not doing it as well. There was nothing that made it feel unique other than the main characters were black and I don't think that's enough. You need to give me a more unique story, you need to introduce me to a world that feels understandable and realistic. So while this world was different, there was nothing that set it apart from other worlds, there was nothing that made it unique enough for me to really sink my grips into it and it wasn't really explained enough if I come to think about it. And we do have these three main characters, we've got our main character and his two friends, but the emotional struggles that they face seem to be a bit repetitive. They seem to be knocking on the same emotional hurdles, which just meant that none of them really developed or expanded as characters because they were falling back into the same patterns each and every time. So as the characters weren't developing and the world wasn't doing it for me and the plot just felt very generic, and by the time I reached the end of it, I just thought, this ends on a cliffhanger and I do not care. So I won't be continuing the series and I was just a bit disappointed by this because I'm always looking for very good black representation in middle grade books and this just wasn't the one for me. But there we have it. Those are all of the books that I read in the month of November. Please let me know in the comment section down below what was a book that you recently read and what did you think of it. Please give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. Hit the subscribe button if you want to see more. And don't you forget to hit that notification bell to be updated every time I have a new video. And you know what they say, onwards and upwards. Excelsior!